everyone, Karibuni. Okay, Magdalena is also here. Um, I'm Maliha and I'm going to be your moderator for today. Um, yes, I've been working with the Flip Floppy Expedition since its arrival in Tanzania. We were first in Mwanza with My Mark My City. So I'm part of My Mark My City, which is a youth initiative by Museum for the UN. So we uh, painted a mural. Essentially, we have our marks in different cities and that is aimed at engaging ordinary people in climate action. And that's so relevant to this webinar because we are gonna be focusing on community and all of us, you know, community is the most like crucial part of climate, uh, the climate movement, I would say, because us as a community is affected by it, but also at the same time, us as a community, you know, affects all of these things onto our environment. Um, so yes, Karibuni everyone, I think I will just let the panelists introduce themselves and then we can crack on. Um, I think we can start with you, Lara. Do you want to introduce yourself? Cool. Hi, everyone. So my name is Lara. Um, thank you for having me. It's really exciting to be here today. Um, so I'm a conservation biologist. My background is in zoology. And then I stayed at uni to do a master's in wildlife conservation. And before coronavirus, I was living in Zanzibar and I was managing a dolphin research project there. Um, so basically, we were trying to collect data on how the wild dolphin populations are negatively affected by tourism. And we also had lots of projects on the side that included things with plastic pollution. So trying to get a handle on the waste management there, because there's not really any infrastructure to sort that out. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to be here today and talk about my experience there. Thanks, Lara. Can uh, Alice, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me and for organizing this webinar. It's, a, it's amazing. It's a platform that we really need. Um, my name is Alice Okonji. I am a development communications specialist. I am currently with Infonile. Uh, Infonile is an organization based in Uganda that works with journalists across um, all the Nile countries, all the 11 Nile countries. We work to tell stories using data and visualization. Um, I'm really happy to be a part of this uh, plastic pollution because we, we, we did a big project on plastic pollution in Lake Victoria that I'm really looking forward to share. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. It's also great having you on since we've done stuff with InfoNile. Um, with the flip flop expedition around Lake Victoria, so Karibu Sana. Mamlo, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, so hi everyone. My name is Mamlo, and I work with Nipe Fagio, a civil society organization based in Dar es Salaam. And actually, what we do, we are much based on uh, waste management, and we have uh, a project, a zero waste project that we are implementing in Dar es Salaam. But also Nipe Fagio, uh, we also joined the flip flop team here in Dar es Salaam and we are helping them to organize uh, some of the events like a cleanup event. So we are very excited to be here and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to chat with you all. Thank you. Thanks Mamlo, also excited to have you here. Magdalena, you're up next. Oh. Thank you, Maliha. Uh, my name is Magdalena Shao, and I'm an assistant lecturer at Muhimbili University of Health and Life Sciences. Uh, my background is in environmental science and management, but I specialize in integrated water resources management. And so I called myself a champion for the SDG number six, which is access for all for water and sanitation. So I'm glad to be here and thanks for organizing uh, this platform where we young people can meet and share different experiences and learn from each other and of course network so i'm looking forward to like chit chat with you all thank you karibu sana magdalena you look so young for like a stereotypical assistant lecturer so ongera um we're also excited to have you and definitely water sustainability is an important topic to look at because it's increasingly under threat 
especially if you go to Lake Victoria and see like the increasing water hyacinth and etc which affect you know the water sanitation and etc so yeah thank you very excited to have you here and sorry for the noise there's a lot of boda bodas passing by um but Aditrudith you're next I think Edith might have um, dropped for a second, but we can carry on and I'll drop her a text after. So I'm really excited to have all of you um, because all of us have a similar interest and some sort of background which is unique and can contribute you know, to this conversation. And community, I, I'm really excited to have the topic of community because I think it's crucial to this. Us as a community is extremely vulnerable and if you start looking at the solutions in, you know, if you start looking at the basic solutions, for example, like consumerism, who is the main target of that? It's community, you know? So a change, they say change always begins at a community level. And all of us, I think, have somehow interacted with the community or have somehow observed and know the impact that climate action is having on communities, as well as what communities can do you know, to bring about change because we're a really powerful source and I think it's time we realize that power and start to use it. Um, so I think I would like to start with Mamlo because Nipa Fagio does great work um, in terms of engaging the community and finding ways for communities to live sustainably. Um, just a few weeks ago, I was talking to Anna and um, she had mentioned their zero waste model, which I would really like Mamlo um, to expand on in a little bit. So the zero waste model, I think, is something that can be replicated at, at a, like a state level, really, you know, a way of collecting and separating waste and ultimately reducing the amount of waste that goes into a landfill. And it started at a community level with Nipa Fagio, and uh, hopefully in the next few years, we can see that coming into legislation. So um, my question to you, Mamlo, is can you give us a little insight into what sort of community-related projects Nipa Fagio do? Um, and you know, what are the problems really that you've noticed and what are the solutions that you guys are trying to bring about with your programs? Thank you. Over to you, Mamlo. Hello, Maliha. I'm struggling with the internet. <laughs> Hello? Hello, we can hear you, Paul. Yes. Thank you. Yes, so far, yes, so far, uh, as Maliha introduced us, uh, we are Nipe Fagio, a civil society organization that is based in Dar es Salaam, but also we have been doing some activities out of Dar es Salaam within the other regions. So Nipe Fagio actually is a civil society organization that was found in 2013, and the aim of Nipe Fagio is to empower the civil society, private sector, and government to build the lasting change towards the turning Tanzania into a clean and sustainable country, consciously through the education on waste management and the reduction of the pollution. So far, we have a lot of uh, projects, but um, uh, currently we are much invested ourselves into uh, two major projects. The first one is Marine Lita, uh, Marine Lita project. Uh, Marine Lita project is much based on a survey along the, uh, the coastal areas in Dar es Salaam and Bagamoyo. So what we do is we conduct a survey uh, along the, 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 uh, the coast areas, the beaches, and we, col we, we collect uh, a trash and do a sorting and the separations, or we call it like audit. And the main uh, uh, aim of this project is to create a database of all the information uh, for uh, 
to, for advocating uh, 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 pollution and uh, marine pollution. As currently, you know, uh, uh, in many developing countries, we are, struggle, we are struggling to have the data for uh, based on marine litter. So actually, Nipefagio started this survey on 2019, and we will be progressing with the survey up to 20, uh, uh, 20, 2022. So then we will, be, we will be developing a report in the data that will be shared with other stakeholders and the government so that we can have a solution together to tackle marine litter pollution. But also Nipefagio currently is implementing a zero waste project uh, a zero waste project, I can say this is like a new thing to Tanzania or East Africa, but uh, uh, simply it's just a normal life of uh, every day, uh, a, a, of normal life of every day. So zero waste project is a model, a model that proposes a sustainable community-based waste management to local community. As we understand currently, the management of waste in, uh, in, in many countries are based on the municipality level. So the community have no authority or mandate to, they, they, they don't have the ownership of the waste management, uh, of waste management chain. So, so uh, this uh, model, we, 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 we are sure that it's going to simplify or to localize the chain of waste management. And the main objective of a zero waste project is to design the efficient and effective solid waste model at the local community and ensure that people at the local community, at the household level, are aware of the impact of their waste. Yeah? And also we aim at building the community ownership that the, uh, the community have ability to, uh, to engage in managing the waste that they are uh, produced. But also this model uh, enables the community to learn how to reduce their waste, to reuse their waste, recycle, and recover the waste produced at their locality. Uh, so if I go into details of this, we have started a piloting uh, for three subword here in Dar es Salaam to implement the project, uh, and so far we 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 are uh, successfully uh, started the project, and we are very happy that uh, the first subword is going so far and successful implementing this project, and that is Bonyoko subword that is located in Ilala at Dar es Salaam, and the. Maybe people can ask themselves, like, why zero waste? Because we had other models uh, that we are operating before, like the municipalities were in, uh, the one who had the authority to collect the waste, to charge the, uh, the waste collected, and to engage the, the collection uh, companies who were the one who go direct to the street or subways to collect the waste. So a zero waste came to localized to, to make sure that apart from having the authority from the municipality, but the community themselves can have ownership of this project and they can have a solution and opportunity to understand what are the impact of the waste that they create, but also they can benefit from the waste that are produced. And this helped to cut the impact of the, uh, uh, of the uh, poorly managed the waste at their localities. Therefore, uh, the main important thing that I think we need to insist in so that people can understand on zero waste is it is not here to eliminate or to cut the system of waste management, but it is here to create a sustainable solution for managing their waste. Example right now, we see there is a uh, increase in the recycling companies, but how many people how, at the community level understand of the recycling? Do they understand of the uh, materials that are being recyclable? They are not. Also, how many people at the household level understand that their waste needs to be separated easily in order to reduce the number of waste that is going to the dump site. 
So if we use zero waste model at our community level, we can simply, so we can simply reduce this, um, uh, the amount of waste that is directed to the dump site and of which are not of beneficial to the community. Therefore, therefore what we need is to push and to make sure that the people understand. So uh, I, I, I can highlight the few, maybe the benefit of the project that we have encountered in, at the community. The first thing is we have managed to employ, to employ the waste pickers included in this project. Example, as the only one subword, we managed to engage about uh, 37 people from the community who are engaged in the, in, the, in the project yet. So the waste pickers have an opportunity to uh, to, to get income, to increase the income, but also have an opportunity to learn the waste management uh, model, but also they have an opportunity to engage, uh, to engage in the work within their community. And this helps uh, them to add value to their works, but also helps them to increase income that also can serve themselves and their their family but also with zero waste model have helped us to to reduce the number of waste that is directed to the dump site example uh, we have four category of waste that we, uh, we we collect from the household we have uh, non-organic that we said the food the food waste we have recycle recyclable waste we have red radio waste and hazardous so collectively, all these categories, you can find like only 20% of the waste can be directed to the dump site. And the rest can go to the recycling industries and other to the uh, 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 composting in a composting center that people use to make a compost. But also we have other people that use the waste to make other, uh, to make other, other uh, products. Yeah? So you can see the link of how, how the community can benefit from a zero waste model instead of uh, the system that was previously working to their community. But also with the zero waste model, a community have the opportunity to change their, 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 uh, to change their behavior. We have a series of awareness programs that we conduct within the community, and that programs are based on schools, youth, and uh, institution within the community, but also with the community, uh, community in general, like the public meeting. So we are making sure that everyone understands the model, but also we make sure that everyone is engaged in this model so that uh, he or she can be responsible of the waste that are being produced within their household level. And so far, so long, I could mention that among of the uh, of the few things that Nipe Fagio we have uh, we have invested the energy, and we are sure that if everyone is able to adapt the system, the zero waste model, we could help to cut a large number of waste that is being directed to the dump site. But also, this would help to link and to improve the industry, the waste management industries, uh, especially. Okay, so especially right now that we, ha we, we have pushed much on the recycling industry. So, so far that is where uh, we need to, uh, uh, to go. So thank you. If you have any question, you can, you can ask. Thank you, Mamlo. I'm so excited to have heard about all of that in so much detail. I've been waiting for so long ever since I heard from the first time. Um, I think that addressing waste at that level is perhaps the most important because once you address it at that level, it's not going to be go, it's not going to be going, you know, all together at the dump site where it creates all of these problems. Um, also interesting, you mentioned composting. Composting is first at a community level, but also at an, an 
at an individual level because you know you if you try reducing plastic or etc at the end of the day you're going to be producing food waste and 70 percent of the food waste actually ends up in the like um, mainstream uh, dump sites for all of the waste then it's actually a resource if we you know use it well um, you can use it as organic fertilizer and if you look at the problems with fertilizer actually fertilizer is one of the biggest uh, pollutants of rivers so this also links in with magdalenas you know water sustainability so yeah thank you so much for touching on that um, and I hope to see this model one day as legislation in Tanzania and it's not something um, that is impossible because it, it works in so many other countries and it's time that we start addressing our waste at our household level and then at a community level. Um, and the way you explained it, this is also a great opportunity for employment and sustainable income for some people. So yes, thank you so much Mamlo and Nipa Fagio for this amazing initiative. Um, I'd actually like to take the ball to Lara because she mentioned that there was um, some community collection of waste and recycling. If there's anything you want to add uh, to Mamlo's points, um, then yeah, please feel free. Yeah, so I think what Mamlo was saying about the fact that having a waste collection system is entirely dictated by, um, you know, the municipal councils is actually really important because um, in Zanzibar, they've only got organized waste collection around Stonetown. Um, and you know that's the only place where it happens. They don't have it in local communities. And this is a real problem. Um, Zanzibar produces about 92,000 metric tons of waste every year and only 30% of that's collected. So you've got 70% that's being dumped on beaches, um, in green spaces, in the sea, wherever, wherever people can dispose of it. And I think we need to be providing them with alternatives. Um, there's this one community that I worked with down in the south, um, a place called Kizamkazi. And, you know, rightly so, the, the communities are sort of piling their rubbish into areas um, where in the wet season, the stream will wash it out into the sea. And there's the saying we have in the UK, which is out of sight, out of mind. And if you get rid of that waste, of course, you're not seeing it. So you're not thinking about the impact that that's having on the oceans, on the marine life, on the corals and things like that. Um, but if you don't have an alternative, you know, what are you supposed to do with your waste? So we need to be organizing waste collections at a governmental level. Um, you know, you've got to give people alternatives. You've got to provide bins that people can put their rubbish in. You've got to teach them how to separate rubbish so that it can be recycled. Um, we need to be educating um, the local children as well on the impacts because really conservation starts with children and we're going to have those younger generations coming through soon. Um, so if we, can, if we can get the message out earlier, then, you know, that's only going to help all of our, our efforts in trying to curb this plastic pollution problem. Um, but yeah, the most important thing is just making sure that the, the infrastructure is there really. Um, we've got to be sorting this out and you know we can't it's not good enough to let 70 percent of of the waste produced to just be to just be dumped we've got to be providing bins and and waste collection sites and and things like that thanks laura i totally agree it's it's not good enough and something needs to be done ideally the responsibility would would be at a government level but you know we have to take it in our own hands um magdalena do you think that this um, that the points Mamlo and Lara have talked about somehow that interlink with you know having this model? How would that affect the water sources we have and you know improve the quality of water, um, etc.? So, do you want to touch on that? Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Maliha. But be before I, I, I go direct to that, I'd like to provide a snapshot of like. Uh, what is the rate of plastic production right now? So around the world, um, uh, it's about from 1950s to now, uh, the uh, production of plastic has increased more than 200 fold since 1950s, whereby uh, around 1950s we're just producing 2 million tons per year. And in 2015, 2016, the production has gone to as far as 381 million tons. 
So this is like a shocking statistic. And if you're not going to act like now, now, we are not gonna get a big result. And uh, the statistics and the research also suggest uh, by 2050, the production is expected to double. So uh, this, um, this gives us as young people and CSOs and all the stakeholders who are working in the, uh, this sector to reduce the environmental pollution to be alerted like we are going to like threat all the environmental comp compartments that air, uh, water and soil. And of course, out of all this that is produced, the plastic that is produced, 55% uh, uh, of the global uh, plastic is just discarded. Only 20% goes to recycling and 25% is incinerated. And as we all know that uh, incineration is not like uh, the environmental friendly kind of uh, plastic disposal because it contributes to air pollution. So maybe um, to answer your question, I would say, what does plastic pollution mean? Uh, plastic pollution means environmental pollution. And when we say environmental pollution, it goes to water pollution. And once water is polluted, what does it mean? It means water scarcity. And we already know that uh, this resource is already scarce, like around the globe, 2.1 billion people, that's like 29% of the um, world's population lack access to clean and safe drinking water. So it's like we added, we adding petrol already to the fire that is burning. Like the problem is there, it's of great uh, and uh, it is significant. And then we are adding uh, this burden now of plastic pollution. Again, water pollution means uh, waterborne diseases and that impacts our health system as well and the economy of the country. And of course, loss of biodiversity. So um, what, uh, plastic pollution uh, impacts a lot into the uh, water, uh, water sector and the water resources, which is already burdened. But um, with plastic pollution now on board, yeah, we are in trouble, that's what I can say. Again, plastic pollution means land pollution because with a lot of plastic, the soil cannot breathe. The aeration won't uh, take place effectively. And then low productivity and then food insecurity. Again, plastic pollution uh, means uh, air pollution as well. The effect of air pollution is not felt like, because it's not like a one-time event. It takes, uh, it takes time to come and notice that this happens. I mean, this happened because of air pollution. So we, 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 we need to take action, even though that we don't see like the immediate effects, but this effect will affect us now. And then we come and realize later that we have not lived uh, a sustainable life. Uh, other effects that might come with plastic pollution to be destruction of uh, the natural beauty of the environment, like our beaches, our oceans, our water resources, and this now affects the tourist sector and then death of aquatic organism. We affect also the, the food production kind because we, 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 we sometimes have seafood and other um, foods from the uh, water resources. Again, the blockage of sewerage systems that increase breeding sites for disease causing vectors and floods. A, a good example is here in Dar es Salaam, whenever it rains a bit, we have like floods everywhere. And then um, having said that, uh, like plastic pollution means environmental pollution and I've, I've, I've touched into the water, uh, air and soil. I'd like to conclude that by saying uh, the future of the community is not promising. The future of the community is scary and the future of the uh, community is very hopeless if we do not take action now. And I was reading this quote uh, that says, if we, not, uh, if we act small, we are going to get small results. So I urge all of us here and other stakeholders to act big so that we get big results. Over to you, Maliha. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, it's actually quite worrying, you know, to hear that from an expert because, you know, you always feel like inside it's better to be optimistic and, you know, have positive thinking, but positive thinking is not going to take away the problem of plastic pollution. Um, and I agree with you, you know, um, sometimes 
you know, communities are very important and are forces of power, but at the same time, um, communities are also sometimes, um, I, I'm trying to find a positive way to put this, but really there is no positive way because the change, yes, it starts with us, but also we need, um, you know, policymakers and big businesses and private corporations to take their responsibility because they are also a community of business. So, you know, if we're talking about a community, like a social community, maybe people living together, yes, we can, we can have some sort of responsibility. But like you said, I think the big action and the big impact really comes from them and for us to link into that it's now our responsibility you know to keep lobbying to keep advocating and to even boycott when it's necessary because you know it's really talking about our future um especially for someone like me honestly like i've already told my family that genuinely i don't think that i would want to have children because I don't know what sort of future, you know, I'm going to bring them into this world for. Um, if you look at things like asthma levels have increased, you know, ever since plastic production existed, because, you know, it comes with all of these secondary impacts to our health, to our environment, you know, and really, I think we're doomed in the next few years if we don't act now, like you said. Um, so besides uh, Nipefagir's zero waste model, which is very promising, and I have someone who's asked a question uh, about that, so we'll get to the questions later. But besides um, their model, do you um, have any suggestions or any ideas as to what urban communities or communities in general uh, can do, you know, to make our environment a better and greener place? Yes, Maliha, thank you. Um, I would like to say, you know, the, uh, the community generally are the one who are responsible for the issue of pollution and issue of uh, 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 making sure that they are hearth and safe. And so uh, we as, as an organization, our role is to make sure that we, we pave the way for them to understand the situation and to wake up and to be engaged in this initiative. So uh, as in Ipefagio, what we do is uh, trying hard to, 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 to engage the community and to create an awareness for to them so that they could be aware of the impact of the waste poor and waste managed, but also to give them a way, uh, a room to uh, engage in our activities so far, like we are, we have the, that we conduct uh, whether at, uh, at the community or at the beach. So, so far, wherever we do all these activities, we, we go with the uh, awareness programs which we trust that if these people are being told of the uh, impact of the uh, waste, uh, waste of the waste, but also are being uh, told of the opportunities that is available to the waste produced, they will, be, uh, they, they, they will be the one who are taking all the initiative, as you said, that uh, we need to, to wake up and we need to push either the, even the system to come up and, and see uh, there is need for uh, for them to change either the policies or or to change whether the uh, uh, the, uh, the production of the, this product like plastic, which uh, totally now is causing is causing the damage to our environment. So far, yes. Thanks, Mamlo. I definitely agree. You guys have a lot of initiatives. Um, that people, you know, can get involved in. Uh, and there's a lot more that one can do besides just sorting and collecting your waste. I mean, that is not really an action that you're taking, but that is merely your responsibility. Um, thank you. Lara, I see your hand is up. Oh, was that? A, yeah. yeah, no, I just wanted to contribute as well. Um, it, it, exactly what Mamlo was saying, engaging local communities and, and getting them to help and actually care about their environment. Um, so some of the stuff we were doing in Zanzibar was organizing beach cleans and we were trying to get as many people from the local community to come out as possible and that number increased week on week on week. 
And I think as long as you show them that there are people within their community who care, then suddenly this collective feeling of, oh my gosh, yeah, we've got a problem, we've got to sort it out, it starts to increase. And the more people that are out there on the beach, then the more they inspire others. Um, I think it's also just inspiring them in other ways. Um, one of the initiatives we started was to um, create eco bricks. So if you have a big one liter or two liter bottle of water, what you can do is actually break down small pieces of plastic and pop it inside the brick, so the water bottle. Um, and then you fill, you fill up the water bottle with other pieces of plastic, which otherwise wouldn't be broken down or would be thrown away. And you can create quite a solid, what we call brick. And there's been so many projects around Africa, there's been an entire school built with these eco bricks, which is obviously taking plastic out of uh, the environment, stopping it from going into the oceans. And what we were doing was rewarding um, the people that bought us eco bricks. So we'd give them a certain number of points. And as soon as they reached a total, they could come and choose from some donated clothes that volunteers had bought over or donated books and things like that for themselves or for their children. Um, and that was a really good way to get people interested, even if they weren't necessarily interested in actually removing plastic from the environment. So it's trying to target the people who do care naturally and those who are a bit more non plastic about it, but still want something out of taking the plastic off beaches. Thanks, Lara. That's really useful. And um, I've seen actually this initiative. I'm not sure if it's the exact same one that you started, but there is an institution called Z Eco Bricks or Zanzibar Eco Bricks, and I've seen them grow. And really now they're engaging uh, women and mamas in collecting plastic um, and giving them like cash rewards. So that is also a way for people to earn a sustainable income. And I definitely think that that is one of the most important things that we have to focus on is how to enable people to have sustainable incomes because some people get incomes from cutting down trees and selling firewood but you know it's about finding those sustainable alternatives because if you come to someone who is in poverty and who often doesn't have access to this sort of information because for those of us who have access to the you know who know what the impact of plastic are and all of these things we have some sort of privilege because it's not in the national curriculum you know they're not taught this at school uh, we either know through social media or through watching tv you know and, and now we have all of this awareness and it's our responsibility to bring it to the people and sort of if people are not as passionate about it you know like you said find them ways you know to to use this passion and develop a passion so that they can care and, and do better things for the environment um all of these are very useful. And I know Lara and Nia Fagio, Magdalena as well, and Dar are all from the coastal community. So now I would like to take it to the lakeside community because it's an equally um, bad problem there. And actually I was um, listening to uh, Bahati, who is one of the Flip Floppies researchers. Um, and he was saying that the plastic problem in the lake is, is actually quite bad, but we just don't see floating plastic because the water is less dense. So, you know, it sinks to the bottom as opposed to in the ocean. So um, I will start with Alice and then to Aditrude. But do you want to, to maybe describe what sort of issues are the lakeside communities facing in relation to plastic pollution? What are the real life impacts? And we know that the community that depends on the lake is huge because it's 40 million people dependent on Lake Victoria. And for me, when, when I think about the lake, I feel like it's more vulnerable um, compared to the ocean. Because if you think about the ocean, it's like a big, vast place, you know, with, with life at, at almost every stage. But the lake is somehow still a closed area. And once all of it dies off, there's nowhere that it can then expand to, you know, um, yeah, so can we start with you, Alice? Garibu. Asante, Asante Sana Malia. And, and thanks for everyone who's joined us today as we, we try to find sustainable solutions to this plastic menace. Um, so you, you've asked what, what it looks like in the lake. I'd like to show you a picture, if, if that's okay. Um, I, I, I want to show you a picture but um, I, I see we're unable to share anything. The picture that I wanted to show you or is, is what 
what life is really in Lake Victoria, because um, uh, Lake Victoria is one of is 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 one of um, the Great Lakes, really. Um, I'm unable to share my screen, but that's okay. I'll, I'll describe the photo to you. So, in in Lake Victoria, you find a lot of fishing communities. There are a lot of fishing communities that depend on the lake, not just for fishing, but they also get their water there. Um, and this one picture that I wanted to share you, you can share the picture with me and I will share it. Oh, great. Let me just share the picture. I've just seen a, a message from Lightness. That's asking me to share the picture with her. Uh, so, so the picture is fishermen, fishermen trying to, trying to just word through through plastic. Just one minute. I will share this so that I am not multitasking. Just one minute. Okay. I've sent you, I've sent you the pictures in your email like this, if that's okay. So you can you can share. I should have told you earlier, I'm sorry. Uh, Anyway, the pictures that Lightness will be sharing earlier were, were got from a project that we did. I, I work with InfoNile, and just to tell you what InfoNile is in a very short shell, is we work with journalists around the Nile region to tell stories, water stories, um, uh, water stories in, in the Nile region. And so we, we identify a common issue, we, we source for data, and then we we offer grants to journalists to go out and cover stories of critical importance to this, this issues. One of the issues we did this time was plastic pollution in Lake Victoria. And um, what the journalists wrote back was really shocking. There were huge piles, huge piles of plastic in just in the shores. Some Malaya. Some was just floating. One of the pictures that I have shared with with lightness is um, a, 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 a river, river called River Ruizi. It, it's just flooded in plastic. You couldn't see water. All you could see is just plastic bottles floating on it. So, so the the the, the thing about the thing about plastic pollution in Lake Victoria that we should really be worried about is um, there's only one outflow. One outflow of Lake, of, of Lake Victoria. It's got a lot of tributaries coming in, but there's only one outflow, which is River Nile, and River Nile has lots of lots of distributaries. And this 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 River Nile it flows, it drains into the Mediterranean Sea. So if there's plastic pollution in Lake Victoria, you must be sure it's finding its way to the seas, finding its way to the oceans. And that's and that's something that um, we we have we have really struggled with. I have sent you the email to your email address. Like, yes, I've sent you an, I've sent you pictures to your email. Sorry, I'm just reading messages and trying to. Yeah, I've sent I've sent you emails to your your to your email. Sorry about that. Um, so, so the, the thing about the thing is, and the data that the, the the data that one of my colleagues mentioned earlier about all that, uh, that finds its way to the water. In, in Kenya, for instance, one of the journalists found five hundred and three thousand metric tons of plastic every year. Only seven percent is recycled. So the rest finds its way to. Um, uh, dump sites or water body, and then the, the other percentage of the way to, to communities are often burned. And of course, you know the danger of burning plastic. You have a lot of carcinogenic oxides. It's really important. And, and so there's there's like a lot of communities that live and depend on electric for the Alice, I'm, I think maybe the like earphone is. Pulling clothes because sorry, yeah. How about sure. now? Yeah, great. Perfect. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I was just, I was just telling you about um, the number of plastic, the amount of plastic that Kisumu, for instance, Kisumu is a small town, not a small town, but Kisumu is a town in Kenya, and just that town produces um, a lot of plastic, 
and very little, like less than 5% is, is recycled. So like in Kenya, like I mentioned earlier, 503,000 metric tons of plastic is produced every year and only 7% is recycled. The rest is thrown in uh, in the water or, and many of this is, uh, it ends up in the water. And, and the rest that are burnt uh, are really just a, a cause for uh, uh, and air pollution, like I think Magdalene, you mentioned earlier. So, so what we, what can we do about it? And and that's like the big question that we 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 all ask. Um, at InfoNow, we just give we, we 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 tell stories. We use data to tell stories, and we we show all this what was found. And I'll just scare you a little with some facts that we found from this project that we did on plastic pollution that uh, is really scary. Um, did you know that some of the mouthwash you use, shower gels, shampoo, they contain microplastic? And, and microplastic pollution is one of the worst forms of pollution because you don't even know it. it you, 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 you inhale it, it's in your clothes, it's in your product. And, and not very many people are aware that microplastic is an actual problem. And, and uh, we also found out that uh, one person, you as Lara or Malia or Lamek or anybody who's, who's listening, you inhale and you consume almost 70,000 particles of plastic every year. And, and that just builds up in your body. And yeah, I know, it's scary. So, so these are these are things that we we want to advocate for, so that we can see a change. And it's just really sad that out of all the 195 countries in, in the world, or like uh, 195 countries, only 15 of them have successful efforts towards burning microplastic. And I know uh, the plastic conversation can take a lot of angles. It, it can be the big ones, the big macro ones, so the polythene bags, the big plastic bottles. And these micro ones that, um, that are just now coming to be seen as very dangerous. And it's, it's, it's one of the things that um, governments, policymakers, consumers all need to be aware about. For example, Uganda imports plastic of what up to $462 million worth every year. It's just, and if you look at the amount they export, it's like not even a quarter of that. So we are bringing in a lot of plastic, a lot of, um, and then we don't even know how to manage it. So, so the question you asked Malia about how the communities are really dealing with it, the communities here are suffering. You find the fishermen in, 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 along the lake Every morning, before they, like every time they want to take their boat out, they have to first clear their path, like clear loads of plastic from their paths, just to take their boat out. And, and they're not blameless. They are the ones who take plastic bottles, they buy sodas and water, and they carry fuel in their jerrycans when they go out fishing. They carry snacks, they carry Rolexes in their small paper bags. And when they get to the water, they eat and throw. So this is, this is something that um, uh, I think we need to be aware of what, what you as an individual, you are doing to contribute to plastic in the region and, um, and how, how bad it is or how bad it could get. And, and if, I'm, I'm afraid if we don't do much, like, like uh, the previous speaker just mentioned, if, if we don't do much, it's, it's very alarming. It, and and there was there was apart from just fishermen struggling with all this, the, the aquatic life, the fish and the water, is, they cannot really tell the difference between a small piece of plastic or a paper bag and what they would ideally refer to as food. So the fish are eating this. And a research that was conducted in Tanzania in 2015 actually showed that 20% of all the fish samples collected had microplastic in them. So at some point they had just eaten some plastic and then you go to the shop and buy this fish and eat it and it's just a big cycle that we are creating for ourselves so um a, apart from what we are doing to biodiversity killing fish um, birds because the birds also end up eating the fish uh, and the communities that depend on this i think plastic pollution um, is is like ending plastic pollution will begin with us 
and it will extend to a bigger corporate responsibility government because they are the ones who allow policies that enable plastic production anyway so i um, i don't know if i've answered your question malaya um and i'll just like give it back to you if i haven't please mention it no alice you've totally answered my question uh and even scared me a little with those facts um so i would just like to go straight ahead to edit through this because if after my visit to lake victoria if you ask me to reflect on the plastic problem there, I think I'll never stop. So at it true that you are, um, I think, a mini plastic expert for uh, Lake Victoria, and we've done a lot surrounding the plastic pollution in the area there. Um, so my question to you, it was the same question to Alice, but I think you had dropped off at that time. It's um, what what do you notice as the plastic problem in Lake Victoria? Um, what are what's causing it, what are the outcomes of this problem, um, and what can, you know, what can us as a community do? Karibu. Asante Maliha, thank you very much for having me here in this um, conversation, it's really interesting. And I'm sorry, I keep on dropping off because where I am, I think it's a problem of uh, the network. I'm in Dodoma, by the way, <laughs> not in Mwanza. So as I've been introduced, I'm Eddie Trudith Mukanga. I'm based in Mwanza, where I work with an NGO, a local organization called EMEDO. EMEDO stands for Environmental Management and Economic Development Organization. And we work in environmental issues and mainly is to empower communities and particularly um, women and young people to be able to engage and participate in um, addressing these challenges that um, among them is what we're speaking about today. Actually, yes, listening to all these facts, Magdalena mentioned them, Alice mentioned them, Mamlo and everybody else who spoke before me, this data, the figures are, are really, really um, scary. And if I, can begin with uh, just sharing about Lake Victoria that um, it is a transboundary resource shared by the East African Community Partner States and it plays a very significant role in ensuring that um, the economic and social developments of these areas are sustainable you know, to, to, to the, to the riparian countries. And, uh, by the way, it is also a repository, you know, for both treated and untreated waste generated from various activities within the basin, meaning in all the three East African countries. Uh, and despite the, you know, the significance and benefit that um, Lake Victoria provides, it is still threatened, the lake itself and its basin, they are all threatened by environmental challenges including the degradation, which is indicated by, uh, for example, uh, reduced fish stock, decline of biodiversity, Alice has mentioned it very well, increased sedimentation and nutrient loads, you know, water has in this, you know, just to mention a few. Now coming to pollution and particularly um, plastic pollution, this adds on to the already existing challenges that are facing Lake Victoria and, and its basin. And therefore this um, conversation that we are having now um, um, is contributing uh, to, is coming at a very right moment. And therefore, if now I come back to uh, the question, Maria, that you have asked, like, um, are there any noticeable differences and impacts and how, how, what are the impacts for the communities. For sure, plastic pollution is a big challenge, is a big problem. And the first thing is that look at it being physical when thrown around on the, on the environment. It creates a lot of you know, challenges, including what Magdalena, I wouldn't want to repeat what has been said already. I would like to focus on what uh, Alice has just mentioned because I work with the fishing communities in the Lake Victoria and she mentioned of the fishers, the way they are really impacted by plastics, uh, the obstruction, just like what water hyacinths also do. You know, their pathways to access the fishing uh, grounds is all the time obstructed by plastics. And to make matters worse, 
even in the in in the while, while in the waters, plastics take very long time to get degraded. And once degraded, those microplastics are what are killing us. With this research that I've, I've been reading through some of the um, some of the um, recent publications uh, that suggest that the results demonstrated um, in in this in these findings uh, say that the fishing fish landing sites or the fish landing beaches along Lake Victoria are the hot spots for plastic pollution. Can you imagine? And in Tanzania, uh, along the Lake Victoria, we have more than 400 landing beaches. So if these are the hot spots for plastic pollution, already you can imagine the extent to which plastic um, is doing harm to our environment, to the people, to the um, aquatic environment, to all the biodiversity within uh, the, the water bodies, but also uh, in, outside the, 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 the water bodies. So plastics, the communities are really impacted. And um, if you have heard also some of the publications and the research findings are suggesting that Lake Victoria uh, Basin is leading in terms of, um, um, you know, um, occurrences of cancer. And this is also linked to the presence and prevalence of the microplastics. And what the, uh, the, the study is suggesting is that they are not yet sure if it is directly the plastics that cause cancer, but the microplastics have a high capacity of accumulating um, chemicals on them. So this is what is also suggesting and um, the, the, it's pointing towards having high cases of cancer and the like in the in the region. So already you are seeing um, how um, um, the communities, uh, the fishers and fish workers, the people around, the way they are impacted by you know plastic pollution in the form of the microplastics and. You know, the thing is that we kind of feel we are not part of it because we are not seeing it by our visual eyes. The microplastics, we all rely on water from Lake Victoria for domestic use and for a lot of other, you know, uses. And therefore, we need to do something already. And for that matter, a meadow is, our approach is to work with um, youth, for example, um, school children through our school clubs, Malia, you are there when uh, we are, you know, launching um, this uh, fight against plastic pollution in the Lake Victoria in Mwanza. We had those young children singing, you know, raising awareness about the dangers that we are facing if we don't do anything about plastics. And this is really important because we are planting a seed in the minds of these people. We are trying to advocate for change and change starts with everybody. But if we impact that with the young minds, with the young generation, that's really, really important. But also work with journalists, you know, with journalists, with the media, the information um, goes across wide and reaches many people at the same time. And a lot has been said already regarding the policymakers, you know, regarding business communities, everybody has a role to play and this is very very important and um maliha with my mark and my city and the meadow we are also collaborating to see to it that uh, especially mwanza but also all over the lake victoria region in tanzania we send these messages across we mobilize the communities we sensitize the communities when i say communities it cuts across everybody be it um, uh, business, be it um, also the policymakers, you know, the government, everybody has a role to play. And this is very, very important and trying not even to scare people, but using the facts that are already there, the scientific um, facts, the data, the figures that um, um, Alice has scared us with today. So it's not that that's scaring people, but they people should face this hard truth that we are responsible and something should be done. And the next thing is that um, I've also reading through um, some you know, publications where I came across this statement that you know, um, in the developed world, they also contribute a lot to our problems today. 
these uh, you know um, takeaways plastic packaging materials that are being sent into our countries it's not necessarily that we are producing so everybody be it from within our countries but also beyond those who are producing they are also accessibility the, the, the problem and therefore we should address we should have policies that speak to that as well no importing, the, uh, we should impose bans to importation of these plastics, but also for those that qualify to be imported, what can be done? We should have policies that also can guide how we can manage all these plastics after they are being used. In Tanzania, yes, we are happy that there is this ban of uh, the single-use plastics, you know, the career bags that are single-use, but still those that can be reused can be recycled can be repurposed what are we doing with that so that we can all sail on the same boat towards plastic free world plastic free tanzania and um, zero plastic so i think um, uh, i was trying to avoid um, um, repeating what others have already said so what i would like to to um close off with is that effective awareness of communities and other stakeholders on the environmental challenges that are facing not just the Lake Victoria Basin and its resources, but all over, you know, is very important. So it's to ensure that the lake receives the proper management at the earliest to avoid any irreversible uh, environmental damage that can happen. Thank you, Maliha, and back to you. Thanks, Edith Judith. It's excellent to have this perspective from you because you're really dealing directly with the people who are dependent on the lake and who are facing all of these impacts. So um, first, I don't know if I should share the pictures from Alice. I'm just going to share the pictures from Alice and then we will go to Magdalene. I think your hand was up and then to Lara. Let me just put this. Um, Right. Let me give you guys, uh, let me give the floor first to Magdalena, and then I'm going to figure out how to share my screen in the meanwhile, because I've never done that before. Karibu Magdalena. Okay, Asante. So um, as Edith and Alice were speaking, uh, I think I should emphasize on two things. Um, even when uh, Mamlo was presenting about uh, the program that they have designed for the community. So I picked that these programs that different organizations are designing, first of all, they, they should get people on board because they understand their problem, they know what they are doing, and they know where those uh, waste are coming from. And of course, they know the tiny details about their society, like what are the perceptions, what are the attitudes of people towards the plastic pollution? And if we're talking about burning the plastic, what do they say at the back of your mind, behind the closed doors? What do these people say? So when you involve the community, you get them on board, you'll get even the tiny details that will help you uh, like fine tune your programs as you go. And then these programs, I can assure you, will be very, very successful. So what I, I insist them is we should not decide for them, we should not plan for them, but rather we should get them on board. Like they, they should be part of that and so that they own the program, they participate and of course they share and automatically the implementation will be very smooth. And again, uh, on the program still, I think they should be very contextual because here we have heard from the lake side and then we have heard from let's say people along uh, the coast here in Dar es Salaam and of course Lara shared a bit of what uh, she was doing in Zanzibar so we have we, we have gotten a, a touch of different perspectives so I'd like to say uh, what works in Mwanza will not necessarily work in Dar es Salaam so we should be a very very um, careful when we're planning for that it's okay to share what we are doing in, our, in different areas as we are, we, are, we are trying to build better communities. But again, we should be very contextual, taking into account the setting of different uh, communities. For example, uh, the behavior of people in Mwanza is totally different from the people in Zanzibar and people here in Dar es Salaam and Kilimanjaro, if I have to say that. So our programs should be very contextual, focusing on the behavior of the people, uh, the attitude, and 
different aspects like their way of life, the lifestyles, everything that they are doing in those communities add into what we want to achieve uh, in, in the long run. So those are the two things that uh, I'd like uh, to, to, to cement on. But then as tomorrow we are going to listen to, 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 to the policymakers, I was lucky yesterday I attended at least one hour and a half of what was happening from the private sector. And I was happy to hear about the initiative they are taking, um, making sure that they collect, they take like the producer's responsibility, collecting the waste that they have produced to go back to their units and recycle them and um, take care of them. But I think that one is not, is not effective since we, we, we keep on seeing a lot of these plastic bottles around, especially I saw one picture from uh, a journalist who shared, and he was in the beach cleaning last Saturday. So he shared a picture of a lot of plastic from these uh, manufacturers here in Dar es Salaam. So I think the producer responsibility is not that uh, effectively implemented. So I think for those who will attend tomorrow, please send a message to, to, to the decision makers that they should really be careful in implementing this, uh, uh, these policies and regulations to make sure that the producers of these waste take the huge responsibility. Again, I'd like to emphasize on intersectoral collaboration because if, for example, um, we should integrate the waste management policies into the urban planning so that it is very easy for us to work together and achieve the um, maximum uh, results because the, the, the people who are working in waste management cannot just sit in their boardrooms and decide for their own. And then these other ones who are dealing with urban planning also sit in their own boardroom and decide. And then they, when they go for the implementation side, now they start colliding. So it's very, very crucial for them to sit together and plan together and decide together and integrate the waste management policies into urban planning so that at the end of the day, we achieve what we call the green cities. Thank you, Malia. I just wanted to emphasize on that. Thanks, Magdalena. I could really not agree more. I think if a program is not localized, it's just not going to work because, yeah, I agree. We have to have local solutions for local problems. Um, and like we see the impact of plastic on Lake Victoria, you know, you have things like water hyacinth, but in, in the ocean, you're not going to have that. So, you know, definitely we have to have that. Uh, I totally agree also that producer responsibility is uh, key. And um, for me, I think that is even uh, more than the community because the products that you look at are so targeted for, you know, uh, ordinary people or even, um, you know, for us, if we think about, okay, maybe I will buy a sustainable bottle and, you know, keep reusing it. But for people who are poor, they cannot afford that. So all of this single use plastic is sort of like really targeted, um, you know, to people who are going to consume in large quantities. Um, and sometimes producer responsibility, it's happy to see people, like I'm happy to see some people do that. But for example, um, sorry to name and shame, but uh, METL, uh, who actually you find most of their bottles on the beaches, um, and you know they're a billion dollar company who I'm sure could afford to do a lot more, you know, for the CSR than they do. They offer 300 shillings for one kilo of plastic bottles. I mean, for me, that's absolutely ridiculous. If you tell me that you have a billion dollar company, you are creating a national crisis of plastic and you're only offering 300 shillings a kilo. I mean, it could take someone five hours, three hours to collect that, you know, in the sun. And then you're just gonna give them 300 shillings where you can't even buy a meal with that much. So I, I totally agree that, you know, now it's our time to push the private sector and the policymakers tomorrow, um, you know, to take more action and be more serious. Um, Laura, your hand is up. Um, so. Here you go, the stage is yours. Thank you. This is turning into a really in interesting discussion, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I completely agree with all the points. And whilst we're on it, I just want to delve a bit deeper into the effects of plastic pollution in large bodies of water like the ocean, because we've mentioned the fact that um, fish are ingesting microplastics and that's accumulating in the food chain. And then, you know, we're eventually eating it. 
but there's also the things like um, plastic pollution just seriously affecting areas of natural beauty, which might be an ecotourism hotspot. Um, and that stops tourists from wanting to visit those areas. So you've got a loss of income, which is affecting obviously the economy. And then when you move to the environmental factors, um, you've got things like discarded fishing gear, which is one of the main um, pieces of waste that's um, consisting of plastic in the ocean. And you know that causes entanglement of marine animals um, and just damage to the coral reefs. I think, I think we forget that reefs are organisms. They're not just a structure. Um, and I think the thing is that when plastic pollution is out of sight and you can't see it, why would you care? Like, why would you feel like you had to make any changes? But as soon as things happen, like the fishermen having to move plastic out of their way on Lake Victoria to actually get out and go fishing, as soon as that starts impacting you, I think people are more affected by it. Um, but yeah, you know, you've got things like plastic is one of the greatest vectors for pathogens and diseases and diseases latch onto plastic and then go down to coral reefs and completely mess up the ecosystems down there. Um, and there was a study that said, you know, the frequency of disease increases from 4% in a pristine reef ecosystem. And um, so that's sort of like your background disease rate. And if you've got the presence of plastic pollution there, that frequency of disease can increase to up to 89%. Um, and that can completely destroy reef ecosystems. And one of the things that we haven't mentioned yet is the fact that yes, plastic pollution is, is causing problems with our biodiversity. It's causing declines in biodiversity, but we haven't spoken about why that matters. Um, and the thing is that if you've got an ecosystem with decreased biodiversity, that ecosystem is less stable. It's less able to deal with other environmental stresses. Um, we're now in a, in a stage in the earth where we've got things like coral bleaching going on because of global warming. We've got ocean acidification going on. So if we've got decreased biodiversity in our ecosystems, they're less able to deal with those other challenges. And it's just this vicious cycle, um, which is just ongoing. and um, you know, those systems, if they're stable and they're robust, they can actually help protect um, coastal communities from really bad storms and things like that. So it, it is in our interest to, to stop plastic pollution and try and prevent this from, from happening. Thanks, Lara. That statistic is really important. I think I'm going to keep it in my fat, fact bank for scaring people in the future. And um, you know, even coral reefs store oxygen, um, you know, and it's important to have biodiversity because otherwise, like you said, our planet is dying out slowly. And I think it's um, it's really important to protect that because it's really what keeps every everything in order. You know, our earth is not like if one thing goes bad, it's like a ripple effect on everything else. So um, since you brought up the pictures and I figured out how to do the screen sharing, let me share the pictures from Alice. Can everyone see my screen? So yes, this is yes, the first goodness. one. Will you, will you just let me tell you where this is? This yeah, is- Yeah, sure. Uh, Over to you, Alice. Thank you. And now I think my hand is up for no reason. Yes, this is, this is Riva Ruizi. Riva Ruizi is the river I was telling you about. It's in Uganda and it, it flows into Riva Nile, which flows into the Mediterranean. And this picture was, was taken, I think, a month ago, last, maybe a month ago. And, and these were just volunteers who show up and try to collect this, this uh, try to clear out um, the plastic from the water. And, and this is alarming. You can go to the next one. I think it's the same people trying to, trying to, to uh, help. And they spent days. They, they can spend a look. They can fill up to up to fifty bags, fifty bags of of like um, bags. The rucksacks, those bags they're holding there, they can fill them with this plastic bottle, and they're just lying there. And you can see these are drinking bottles, but drinking water and juice and sodas. So yeah, this is this is very alarming. And maybe you can show the last one is is these are the fishermen I was telling you about earlier. 
who every time before they leave they have to they have to collect and clear out um uh, the plastic because some of this gets stuck in in their systems and yeah so so we are viewing your screen malaya we are looking at your email well yes these were the three pic these were the three pictures that um i wanted to share with you and something that lara has brought up that i also would like to mention is so we we made a magazine we made a, a magazine with stories stories that have stories that the journalists did well this magazine is it's it's a bit cool not very cool but it's cool because the front part is made out of plastic waste we were just trying to 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 be outstanding to show um what you can do with plastic and and we already have the problem the problem is here now and and you can collect loads and loads of plastic but if you don't know what to do with it if you're not able to recycle it then that will be another problem that you created so you just have uh, a a load of plastic that you don't know anything to do with and and so um maybe maybe this this kind of engagement should be a forum for you can look at what what is being done with plastic like you mentioned lara about the 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 plastic bricks you were making from bottles this this plus this one was made for us by some organization here they also call themselves eco bricks i i think eco eco is the way to go so good stuff and and the last thing that you mentioned one of the journalists in tanzania she reported that um the the problem in in the beach in the beaches of tanzania was mainly caused by the fishermen who use a bad type of fishing net so this fishing net has actually been banned by the government if you use it you you can be fine but many of them because it's the cheapest and readily available is the one they often use and it takes up to 200 years to decompose so yeah this is um this is very alarming back to you ma Thank you. Um, I will just go straight to Lara. Your hands up. Yeah, thank you. I just thought we haven't actually mentioned the fact that tourism plays a massive uh, role in the production of plastic and the production of waste. Um, in Zanzibar, over the last thirty years, tourism has increased tenfold. It's just skyrocketed, and there isn't the infrastructure to actually support. Uh, the amount of waste that's produced by tourism um on zanzibar there's a private waste removal company called zanrec who are doing amazing things but they're still seeing a lot of hotels and resorts um being reluctant to sign up um to have their waste taken away and recycled which is kind of mind boggling to me if you've got tourists who want to come and visit this this beautiful island um who are obviously attracted to it because of its natural beauty and because of all the the marine biodiversity in the ocean surrounding it and yet those hotels are not prepared to to pay for responsible waste disposal um which i think is really interesting and i think that tourism has to be brought up because it does play a massive factor uh in this problem you know it's not just the local communities it's everything it's it's our thinking it's our way of life it's it's our actions and um we can't just place the blame or um the sole responsibility on on communities thanks lara um definitely i agree um that tourism plays a huge role in this and uh, on some of the zanzibar facebook groups you can just see people always complaining about the way how irresponsible tourists behave just throwing glass bottles on the beach and actually besides just the environmental damage it actually even cuts people on the legs and stuff like that so those are like um the very like gruesome impacts that we see um and very like straightforward but if you can have a piece of glass slit your leg till you need stitches can you imagine what the microplastics are going to be doing to your body over the years We have a few questions which um I'm going to go through in a second but I just want to share my screen again. And now that I know how to do it, I'm never going to stop. No, um I just want to show um this picture of a water hyacinth. I'm, I hope you guys can see it. Um and this is a fisherman in Lake Victoria trying to get 
you know, fishing because of the water hyacinth invasion. And um, I only knew of the invasion when I visited Mwanza recently uh, as part of the Flip Floppy campaign. And, you know, realized that it's something that looks pretty, that bl blossoms really pretty flowers, but that is actually destroying the lake and stopping oxygen from going in there. And um, essentially, someone from the Flip Floppy explained to me that essentially what it's trying to do is clean out the lake. Um, and the more pollution there is in the lake, the more this water hyacinth is going to keep increasing. And it's a problem that we can't stop. I also, okay, I think I need to stop sharing my screen now. And so we have a plastic pledge that we've started uh, as part of the beat pollution campaign in Tanzania. Um, and so far we have a few restaurants at the Slipway uh, and Slipway themselves who have signed up for the plastic pledge. And um, that means that they will explore sustainable alternatives and make a promise that wherever possible, they will avoid the use of, of single use plastics. And we hope that um, we can expand this campaign, especially to Zanzibar. When the flip floppy had gone to Zanzibar for the first time, there was, um, you know, keenness from the hotels there who um, stopped using single use plastic straws um bottles and stuff like that and actually that um that sort of momentum led up to the single use plastic ban in tanzania so um yeah i think that it's a huge sector and it's important that we take responsibility um considering how much waste they produce alice um your hand is up so we will go straight to you while i look at the questions Oh, I, I, I think I hadn't realized that my hand was up. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You can look at the questions and save us some time. Yeah. Oh, well, Marliha, you look at the questions. I can't jump in for Alice. <laughs> sure. The opportunity. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to highlight on uh, what Magdalena has just said regarding um, how do we work with the communities, the strength of the communities. I guess it's on how we do it. I'm going to share the practical example of exactly what we've done. We call for first public meetings when we want to work with a particular community. And then they will identify like 30 people whom they will, they will participate in the uh, program, the environmental program in that particular community. And what we do together with them, and it, it becomes then like a back and forth between the overall community engagement and representation through that particular community group. And they are the ones who identify what are the problems, environmental problems within that particular community. We do what is called transect walking. So we walk around, we look at the, you know, everywhere, and then they will have the whole list, and then they will prioritize what do they really want to do. So this is really, really powerful. And it came to a point, just to make a long story short, that we had uh, even um, monthly, even before that um, national level monthly cleanup you know, campaign, we already had started at that very local level, that community through a community group. Uh, every month we'll pass house by house to check why, how are they managing their waste. And that was really powerful. And this is um, um, how we do. And again, just to emphasize the importance of you know, any intervention to respond to what community needs actually not parachuting and coming up with your own solutions, that will be yours, not theirs. And that's why we are missing sustainability. And for this matter, even in the leg zone now, what we are wanting to do based on these research findings that um, the, 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 the fishing, uh, the, the, the landing beaches, they are the hot spots for plastic pollution. We should now engage with the fishers themselves. How are they seeing this problem? You know, how is it impacting them? How do they identify themselves with such kind of challenges that they come along with the plastic pollutions? And what can they, and together with other communities, what could we do together? So I think this is what would at least create some kind of, you know, 
energy and sustainability and you know uh, sustainable solutions we need them and um, yeah i just wanted to uh, and another thing regarding the, the the ghost fishing you mentioned of this fishing gear that uh, can last for more than 200 years and what they cause i just wanted to bring this um, word that they do ghost fishing whenever they are left um, uh, beneath the waters, they continue to fish without no one knowing, and they continue killing fish and destroying the biodiversity. So these are such are some of the things that we need to bring to the attention of the fishers when it comes to pollu uh, plastic pollution, together with other you know challenges. Thank you, and back to you, Maliha. Thank you, Edith Trudith. Um, I totally agree 100% that public meetings are an extremely effective way of getting to the root of the problem. And I noticed this when um, I went to a lot of public meetings before, but mostly for political issues. Um, but the first one I ever went for an environmental issue was the one in Mwanza um, that we had, you know, on the second day of my arrival. And really, these are the people that we have to engage because they're the ones who know where all of these problems are and etc. Um, so without repeating any of your points, um, but yeah, they were very important and crucial. I would like to go straight to Magdalena because your hand is up. Garibu. Oh, Asante. Uh, I just want to add up a little bit to uh, what Edith has said and um, regarding the partnership like the people, the community, the young people or the CSOs uh, which are working for, for beating up the plastic pollution. I think partnership is key. Complementing each other's effort is uh, very crucial so that we don't duplicate the effort. So if I have the resources to create awareness, somebody else shouldn't come with the same resources to create awareness, but rather if I have resources for uh, creating awareness, somebody else should have resources for maybe building uh, infrastructures, maybe recycling units, etc. So I, I just wanted to add up on that, like complementing each other's effort is key rather than a duplicating effort. So thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, sometimes I'm a little sensitive on the issue of raising awareness because I feel like um, organizations I don't want to name and shame, but organizations who have the potential of doing more than just raising awareness focus a lot of uh, funds and a lot of sometimes unnecessary meetings on raising awareness. Although I realize that raising awareness is crucial to this problem because uh, I was in Kirua for a few months. Uh, I was living there and um, I was talking to the fishermen there and they would literally laugh at me when I tell them that you know stop using plastic because the fish are eating plastic and it's going to come and bite you in the future they would laugh at me and say like no fish is not going to eat plastic they're not stupid they know what their food is so of course there is like a huge importance um in raising awareness but how much awareness are you going to raise you know you're in raising awareness sometimes with the wrong communities because we, we need to do more than raising awareness at this point i think a lot of people are aware but they don't have channels um, and many people are passionate and they want to do something, but they don't have the channels, you know, to put in this energy. And now that is uh, our responsibility to come together and, you know, find solutions to this problem. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions and comments, and we have one from Ella, which I think is very, very important. And she says, um, it's not just plastic pollution that is damaging our environments and ecosystems but also our ways of life and lack of respect for the environment. This is an issue of negligence, exploitation, and also mindset. I agree. And I think that this problem stemmed at some point with the industrial revolution, with, you know, when, when we commercialized everything and everything became on a mass level. And us as human beings, my personal belief, my, my life is very nature-centered. I'm fascinated by nature. I feel like a, it's even more fascinating than science because it's like a natural science. And, and when I think of the way I am and my life cycle is, is the same as a flower. And I think the important thing is that, you know, um, we have to have this sort of mindset where we admire nature and we admire the way that it works. Uh, and that's only when we will understand the importance of a natural cycle, because 
I think when human beings came in with all of this intelligence and all of this power, it's when we started destroying everything. Um, so yeah, I totally agree that it's, it's an issue of negligence and exploitation. And um, I was reading a few weeks ago, uh, I maybe need to get this fact checked, but I read that there are plans uh, for a sustainable city on Mars. And I'm very concerned because it's like, you know, all the all the big fish who have actually put us in this mess have enough money to just fly off to Mars and live their, you know, their best life. But we're going to be left with this planet and it's at some point going to become a toxic wasteland. You know, I'm so sorry, but I love to be positive. But really, 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 this place is going to be a toxic wasteland if it isn't already. I mean, the pictures we've seen so far are actually traumatizing. Like, I can never get that image out of my head because those plastic bottles, if you think about every single one of them taking almost uh, 1,000 years to decompose, that, you know, it's like our next hundred thousands of years is just going to be in plastic bottles decomposing. And the issue is they're still being produced at a mass level, tons a day, you know. Someone, um, it's really true that producers who are not responsible are the threat to nature. Extended producers' responsibility could be could be the best to tackle plastic pollution. Sorry, uh, I think my internet cut off. And I just want to expand on the point of extended producers' responsibility could be the best way to tackle pollution. I think it's the best way, but also the only way, because at the end of the day, consumers are going to keep consuming. And sometimes it's almost like um, impossible. You know, you can be stuck in a place and you, the, your only alternative is a plastic bottle. But if us as human beings have the intelligence to come up with a chemical combination that created plastic, I'm sure that if we focus enough efforts, energy, and money as well into finding sustainable options, we weren't born with plastic. You know, we were born in a very a nature-centered communities, very nature-centered lifestyles. And that's why I like spending most of my time in rural areas or in you know, quiet areas because it really lets me appreciate appreciate nature and get away from these problems. But if I'm getting away from them, the problems are not really going away. So yeah, it's about finding sustainable alternatives. Lara, your hand is up. So I will go straight to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to say, I think it's a really sad world that we live in where everything is based around money. Um, and we are now living in this technological era where we are so obsessed with technology making money, technology making money that we've become so dissociated with nature um, and we're all dependent upon it for our survival. And I think, unfortunately, until we can monetize the value of nature, I don't think that many people are actually going to, well, any of the big dogs anyway, are actually going to change anything because what monetary value do they get from nature of course we know the value of nature we know that it provides us with fresh water we know that it provides us with uh, crop pollination which is obviously important for for world um, food security um and there was a study a few years ago by um an, an ecologist and he came up with this estimate that if we were to pay for all of the services that ecosystems provided us with, it would be something in the region of 34 trillion US dollars every single year. Um, now, I don't know about you, but that is a lot of money. I don't know how on earth we would ever club that together to pay for all of the services from nature that we currently get for free. But we are destroying it because we're getting money from other things. And I think that that's one of the things we need to address. Um, and it, I, it saddens me that this world we live in is dominated by greed, essentially. Um, so yeah, back to you. Thanks, Lara. That's actually a huge figure. And I think um, compared to what, you know, the multi-million dollar companies get, you know, I really wish that all of this money, although nature is much better than a capital, like, Nature itself is uh, bigger than this capitalistic world, but if we really had to pay back in monetary terms, I think would be 
would be doomed. And I think in the future really is when we'll wish that we could have paid nature to do her job. Um, that she's kind enough, you know, to do it for free. And it's where our source comes from. So I just want to um, look a little bit more on the question. Um, Okay, so we have one from Besta who says there is more pollution, especially in the sea. Here in Mafia Island, we normally conduct beach cleanups every month. The most trash found here are bottles. Can our government penalize the companies that are producing such products? Or the companies, for example, Azam or Mo, can have uh, an MOU with the government on how they can manage their products. Um, and there's also um, a bed. Abendego Stefan, who said, I think that the most producer of plastic bottles are the beverage industries. The best solution is to cut off the chain of plastic bottles waste is to emphasize the installation of water refill stations in many places around the city. Thank you for both of these comments. And um, I think the idea of a water refill station in the city is such a good idea. And if you if you bring these proposals, you know, now to to big businesses or to the government, what they will tell you many times is that that is inconvenient for people. But what about the inconvenience that the fishermen are facing when they have to carry all of that plastic out of the lake before they go fishing? And I think the most important thing is that this culture of having things so accessible and so disposable needs to be like, out of our minds you know we need to get rid of this whole culture because it's not the way we were born it's not the way we were created and it's not the way the natural cycle of this world works and everything we've seen that goes against the natural cycle of this world is bringing us problems and and for us now it's still easy to to find excuses to this problem to these problems but I think ultimately it's about we have to face this inconvenience because I mean we're not here you know to have everything yes we're the most intelligent beings but animals still have to walk to the river to get water so why can't we also live in the same sort of harmony with nature and you know not overuse nature just for our convenience um Alice your hand is up so straight to you. Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to say on that um, plastic production, we produce so much plastic every day. And, and, and the comment that uh, beverages and, and plastic bottles are the biggest pollutants um, uh, of, of, of the environment is very true. And the, the, the thing about it is, and I hope this, this is brought up tomorrow, with the policymakers, every day they give they give uh, access to to resources that are used to make plastic. So, um, this natural oils, natural gases, crude oils, the the monomers that they use to make this plastic. Every day they grant the the, the policymakers have they grant access to organizations. They grant them access to these resources to be able to produce millions and millions of bottles every day. I think, and someone asked the question that, oh, if, even if we were to recycle all the, all the bottles and we're just creating more plastic products, I mean, it's not going to, to take them away. And I responded to him via text and I said, there are organizations that let you um, bring back what, what the product that you recycle. For example, if they make plastic trims, um, so if the plastic thing is broken, you can take it back and then they can melt it again and recycle. So it's like a process of re-recycling. But that, is that enough really? He asked and, and I said, quite frankly, I'm not sure that that is even enough compared to the amount of plastic that we produce every day. And, and, and the best thing that we can do now is to reduce the production of plastic at that high level. If we're just trying to find a way of recycling it down here and making earrings out of plastic and making boats and making anything, are we going to really be able to use all that plastic? So yeah, I, I think the powers to produce plastic shouldn't be given to everyone. Um, yeah, that's, that's my comment. Thanks, Alice. Um, I think you're referring also to the comment uh, that someone had left here. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so 
we are going to wind up in a few minutes and I'm just wondering if anyone, any of the panelists, uh, I did true that they see is not here, um, but if any of the panelists have any additional questions um, they want to ask, you know, to each other or any comments from you guys, um, then please raise your hand. Lara, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to add to the fact, um, first of all, about the water refill stations. Uh, we've started rolling those out across the UK and people love them. Um, there's a couple where it, it counts up and shows you how many bottles of water you've saved by refilling your, your recyclable water bottle at the station. And some of them are in their millions already, which is amazing. So I think it can and does work, um, but someone just has to be at the forefront of implementing that. And then just on to plastic bottles. Um, I recently saw that uh, Coca-Cola, who are obviously one of the biggest companies in the world, who used to produce all their drinks in glass bottles, which is obviously much easier to recycle, um, they stated that they wouldn't stop producing plastic bottles until we stopped buying them, which is mad. What, what is that about? Like, why are these big companies not taking responsibility for this? There is only so much we can do and it's got to come from higher. What on earth are you doing? You produce, you, you produce your drinks in glass bottles already. So cut the plastic out. Why, why are we messing around with this? I, I just don't know. Thanks, Laura, for sharing that. I'm actually fuming. Wow, if I could meet the CEO of Coca-Cola, I don't think he or she is ready. That's actually ridiculous. That is crazy. And I just don't have anything to say. I'm just really mad because these corporations, you know, it's like they try and slap it in your face that, you know, we will do whatever we want. I mean, this is a capitalist world at the end of the day. Oh, wow. That's actually disturbing. Like it's actually very disturbing. And like you said, with the glass bottles, everywhere I go and in Tanzania, we're very, very, very lucky to still have the glass bottles. Everywhere I go, I, I must drink in a glass bottle. Otherwise I'm just not going to have it. And Coca-Cola, there's so many even ethical problems with them that I just don't want to comment anymore because then this is going to start getting political and like all humanitarian. Um, so yeah, Alice, do you want to come in quickly? Yes, I'd like to, to come in just as we, we're wrapping up. This, since the advent of COVID-19, there's been new waste, new plastic waste. We've got the masks, the masks that we wear and throw, the blue surgical ones. They are now coming in colors. I saw in Kenya, they have pink and black and different colors. And, and this, this now, are, uh, and they, they, I was, I was reading some, I was doing some research earlier that stated the COVID waste that is ending up in our water is quite alarming as well. So you find the masks uh, and these gloves that uh, people, the, the, the plastic ones, they are just contributing at a very high level to of the plastic pollution that is currently going on. And, and I think this is one thing, we've got loads of problems, like we've mentioned here, like plastic pollution is mad. It can leave you more angry than motivated, if anything. And, and, and I think with, with this one, one particular, I've been trying to advocate for us to use recyclable masks, so wash and wear, or a mask that you don't have to throw away immediately when you use it because these are also just ending up in the water. They're ending up entangled in livestock. The livestock are eating our masks. It's, it's, it's now the COVID-19 pandemic has not made plastic pollution any easier. So um, if anything, and I know many people leave such webinars and they wonder, okay, so what now? What do I do? Buy myself a bottle, okay, I already have a, a bottle. Maybe you can stop using. You can stop using uh, the the throwing away masks. Those masks they are so cheap, but then you use them on tour, You can stop doing that. Maybe you can stop sorting the waste. Maybe you can identify uh, a, a plastic recycling next to you. So you and your neighbors, you be like, okay, so this is our plastic. Here it is. If you yeah, you just like be be responsible from yourself first before you expect all these organizations to be responsible for you. Yeah, thank 
sa lot of money. Thanks, Alice. I just want to add a little bit before going to Magdalena. Uh, you're right that sometimes these comments are, are more give you more anger than motivate you. Um, and if I don't mention at the end of the webinar, I really, really would like to encourage everyone to boycott Coca-Cola as much as you can, because if there's something we can do, then, you know, we have to start doing, doing it as ourselves. So yeah, Magdalena, straight to you. Okay, um, as, you, as you mentioned uh, something on politics, uh, I just want to like end my uh, point by saying uh, political will is also very, very key as far as plastic uh, pollution is concerned. If we want to get far, we need uh, these decision makers on board. Um, I think the, the, the policy makers keep on saying uh, young people need to employ themselves, need to like be very proactive, but at the end of the day, the, I think there are no policies that um, are very friendly in financing, for example, helping financing the startups that are advocating for sustainable communities, sustainable environment. So it's very crucial for them to like walk their talk. Once they say they should also uh, like implement what they're saying and help young people and CSOs who are advocating for uh, sustainable communities like to, to move forward, like to employ themselves. That's what they, they, they need to do. I, I, I know many young people who have brilliant ideas, but then they lack financial uh, support. So I think it's high time that uh, the politicians and all those decision makers now to walk their talk. Thank you. Thanks, Magdalena. I totally agree. And as a young person, there's nothing more important for me especially as a young person who has decided not to go to university, it does sort of limit me in terms of careers because I can't choose just any career. A lot of them require uh, degrees and stuff like that. And I just, um, yeah, that's why I decided to have a small sustainable business of my own. And I do have a small sustainable business called Natural Living where um, like we engage with, you know, sustainable farmers like seaweed farmers because, you know, seaweed actually, stores more carbon dioxide than land plants. Um, so yeah, and it's really nutritious. So, um, and I do recognize that I come from a point of privilege and that's why I've had the opportunity to do this. But I think that employment and youth employment is a huge problem. And like we said before, finding ways for people to earn a sustainable income is I think one of the most important channels for our future because at the end of the day, we all need to eat, we all need you know, money for rent. And it's important to make sure that all of these things are, you know, are achieved in a sustainable way. Um, Lara, your hand is up. So I'll go straight to you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch upon the point that Alice made about um, the pandemic and how it's caused lots of um, the disposable face masks and things like that to contribute to the problem. Um, but I also wanted to put more of a, a positive spin on the pandemic because I feel like, especially over here in the UK and in other countries where we've had loads and loads of lockdowns. I mean, we've been in lockdown now since January and we're only just coming out of it. And this is our third lockdown. Um, and I actually think that this has given us an opportunity to reassess and redefine our relationship with nature. Um, and I think that people are starting to realize now more than ever, considering that they've been locked up for however many months of the last year or so, that our relationship with nature is so important and people have found, you know, solace and they've gone out to nature for their walks and they've de-stressed. And I think that maybe for us who, you know, we are all trying to raise awareness or engage communities or talk about the, the problems that our planet is facing. And it's not just plastic pollution, there's so many different aspects. Um, I think maybe we should think really optimistically about this and take advantage of the fact that people have realized that nature is, is an escape for all of us and it should be protected. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, it's given us an opportunity to, as I said, redefine our relationship with nature. Thanks, Lara. Um, so yeah, I think we have 10 minutes left and it's time for us to wrap up. There's just a few points that I want to leave everyone with and that it's all of us have an individual responsibility to take action. And a good starting point is even 
doing a compost, you know, taking responsibility over the food waste you produce because food waste, when it goes to the landfill, it takes a lot longer to decompose. It turns into harmful gases. And I live in an apartment, but I still managed to, to have my own compost and use the, the liquid from my compost as a fertilizer for my plants. It was a little smelly, but like we said, sometimes we have to go you know, the unconventional route and do things that are not as convenient for you. So yeah, I would really, it's honestly been such a pleasure having all of you here, um, the conversation. I haven't even asked all of the questions on my list, but I think that we have all covered everything and the conversation, you know, just flowed so smoothly. Um, I'm so happy to have people from all angles of the world, from Uganda, from the UK, from Tanzania. Um, and I think it's important for us to share all of our um, experiences, um, you know, and our best practices. Um, yeah, so I would really like to encourage everyone to take up a sustainable solution, whether it's individually or in your family or in the community, but change starts with you. Um, also boycott Coca-Cola because I am still fuming, honestly. And um, yeah, and you know, really just any, if you ever meet any corporations or any people that have power, make sure that you use that opportunity to advocate for the environment. And um, in Tanzania, I'm sort of glad and happy that we haven't had any lockdown. So we haven't had as much time to reflect on our relationship with nature. But I hope that this will serve as a reminder for all of us to take that time and um, reassess our relationship with nature. Um, I would also really, really encourage everyone to have at least one plant in your house because it starts with that. I mean, I absolutely love my plants. I think about them even when I've traveled and, and it really helps me to, you know, I even ask my dad to send me pictures of my plants to make sure that they're doing okay. Um, and it really helps me to realize that the life cycle, you know, of nature and that it's something existing and it's something that needs our care and love and attention. And if someone else is looking after it differently to the way you would, it's not going to survive. So really all of us have a very important and individual role um yeah in ecosystems and biodiversity and yeah i'm just so happy to have all of you here um it's been an amazing session i just want to um read on to the comments and see if there's anything we should check out um please do if you guys want to just have any last comments you can just put your hand up if you want to um, maybe promote your social media page or, you know, allow people watching this to engage with you. If anyone wants to give a last comment, please raise your hand and the floor will be yours. Here you go, Lara. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who watched and, and tuned in. Um, this was super way to spend my afternoon so I've really appreciated it and it was lovely to meet all of you guys as well and hear about the amazing work that you're doing um so obviously when I stopped living in Zanzibar because of the pandemic I started to focus more on my wildlife photography and through that I share um lots of conservation stories from around the world and things like that and I would love some of you to join my journey um, so if you wanted to find me on Instagram, my username is at Lara underscore wildlife. Um, and it'd be great to, to see some of you and also follow you back and hear all about your stuff. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lara. You definitely should follow her because she has really, really cute pictures of lion cubs, of everything. So, yep. Yeah. Mamlo? Yes. Thank you, Maliha. And... On my side, I would like to invite everyone to visit our pages, Instagram pages, Nipe Fagio, and we will be sharing uh, the progress of our zero waste uh, uh, pilot studies. And I hope uh, you guys will be enjoying and will be interested in many information that you are going to, to get there. So please just visit our, also our website. We also share a newsletter every end of the month. So I will be happy if you guys connect with us and I appreciate. Thank you. Thanks, Mamlo. We will be sure to do that if we aren't already. Um, Nipa Fagio is actually one of the leading 
environmental networks and organizations in Tanzania. I'm just gonna right now uh, put into the text box the username from my mark my city and just explain a little bit again. So our uh, logo is a blue fingerprint and a fingerprint is individual to every single person. So again, I would just like to remind all of you that you all have the power, you know, to take action and um, yeah, do something unique for the environment that will make an impact. So thank you so much, everyone. This has been an amazing session. I'm so glad to have met all of you, um, the guests, as well as the panelists, because it's my first time interacting with some of you. And uh, yeah, we're friends now and we're a new eco community. So thank you so much, everyone. It's such a pleasure. And if you're ever in Dar in Tanzania, it would be great to catch up. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Karibu. Oh, thank you guys. It has been the most amazing two hours. Oh, oh yes. thank you. It has. Asante. Oh, Alice, you're doing good. <laughs> yeah. And please don't mention, don't forget to mention the one who wanted to speak Swahili. So oh yes. <laughs> Okay, Santani, guys. I'm not sure if I will end this or. I think Lightness has taken over as a host. Maybe yeah, she yeah, yeah. have something to say. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, Lightness said she will end it. Mm hmm. And she has nothing to say. But thank you, Lightness, for organizing this and for being so patient with me always. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye.